that's the gate pattern. Okay, so I'll get you to walk from probably like here out to that blue line there, the second blue line, and I'll get you to walk back and we'll analyze the gate pattern. Walk how you normally would. Change anything. We'll get you to walk back towards the camera here. Excellent. Okay. There's a lot of good things with your walk. Okay. What people typically forget is that it's the smaller things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis that can help our bigger things. What I'm trying to say is when you get into exercises, if you're kind of recruiting your dynamic, which may be dysfunctional and the mechanics may not necessarily be completely there, you will apply those strategies when you start working out. So it's the smaller things that you can kind of change. Now, you have a lot of good things going on with your walk, and there's different people's type of walk, and there's different types of walks, but if you're getting a lot of recruitment in the legs, but no recruitment in the upper body. The upper body kind of just stays stationary. And the biggest thing is when people start doing an external bias, I'm over-exaggerating your position, but people start doing that external bias, excuse me, they won't recruit their big toe. And if you change the mechanics on every single day of learning how to recruit the big toe, naturally you will learn how to probably recruit the hip extension and recruit more expansion through the abdominal wall, which is actually going to give you more endurance and just give you more mobility. So it's important that when you're walking, like I said, the smaller things lead into bigger things. When you're going to walk, get in the habit of almost pushing off the big toe and get your recruitment back behind you. Okay, so you're getting your arms to kind of commit both ways and then you're able to kind of push off that big toe and that'll just naturally start giving more subtle exchange of landing, catching and pushing. The one thing people don't realize is the majority of stuff that we do is rotational. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you put your hand on your waist, so go ahead and do this, and you go to walk, so you need to walk across the camera here. You feel your thumb kind of pushing into your ass, or your ass pushing into your thumb. Okay, so walking rotation. You can imagine how much more rotation you get when you're jumping, cutting, running, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's super important that you are now finding the full reaction. So if I go supination, I go to step to pronation, I don't want to limit that by just stopping there and going. What I want to get in the habit of doing is literally pushing through the toe. So if I was trying to walk a little better, your walk is pretty much there. It's just I'm pushing through my toe. That way I just get used to using my big toe. This will apply itself into some of the movements, like the next one. We're do. Okay? Let's look at your walking lunge. I'm going to get you to lunge for me. We'll get you to lunge, maybe going away from the camera, and you can tell me how it feels. Okay, typically when you're lunging, where do you feel? very good lunger, but a lot of the times we see people lunging, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very unstable and they may get knee deep from lunging. Yes, they may lunge, the knee collapses in and they're all over the place, okay? And then, the legs are getting stronger because they've done repetitions like this, and now they're introducing resistance, weights, barbells, kettlebells, you name it, okay? If their mechanics are off and now they've introduced more of a workload or progressive workload, what are the likelihoods of them getting injured? Definitely increasing. Okay, so you have to learn the mechanics of a proper lunge first and foremost. Put this in perspective for people, I like to go over a running pattern. And I'm going to run right at this camera, why not? Okay. When I run, do I run like this? Or do I get my arms to move? My arms start including the movement. Okay? The best way to really teach that is I need to get a full body experience. If I'm doing a very healthy, uh, sound moving lunge, I'm going to get a lot of recruitment from the glutes, the hamstrings. I'm going to feel a pull through the quad. they will assist the movement. They're not necessarily going to lead the movement. My hip stays in what we call a stack or a neutral position. I'm going to feel it in the upper back and I'm also going to feel it in my core. Okay? To really apply that strategy, we learn how to kind of use our arms here. So look, do this on the ground. You're going to do it right in front of the camera. You're just going to join me here. So you don't mind like standing right here. And then we'll get down to the lunge pad. The biggest thing is you want to use the properties of torque or stability prior to creating a system. It's all about how you set up, okay? Typically speaking, if I'm an anterior loader, I'll do what most people do and they'll hinge to their hip a lot. Or they'll 
let their torso drop. They're not literally loading the hip. So the best way to really do that is you need to kind of keep the hip stacked, and that's just you kind of squeezing the glute. Squeeze the glute as hard as you can, okay? And we're gonna get involved with using our arms, so you're gonna treat it like you're sprinting. You're gonna take the opposing arm, and what you're gonna think is, all the blades are back, I'm shoving my knees out, I'm squeezing my glutes, and I'm pitching my shoulder blades back. Now when I go to power out of this, I'm gonna treat it like a sprint with the arms, and what I'm gonna to try to do is, instead of worrying about going forward, I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna create it all in one explosive movement. So if I was here, I have the tight shoulder blades down and back, and I go up. I drive through that shoulder girdle. Drive through your left shoulder girdle like you go to lunge. Good. And as you can see, it was a little bit more explosive in that lunge. And typically speaking, try it again. This time, don't let the knee touch the ground. Just shallow of that. Okay? Engage this hip. Okay? Get the shoulder blades back. And push your knees outward. Both of them. Try to drive that arm as you stand up. Yeah, a lot more explosive. Okay, and you have more stability. What that does is it starts activating the right muscle groups. You keep your hips joints, or you keep your joints in general stacked at a good uh, aligned position, and you activate the right muscle groups. This is the glutes, the hamstrings, the core, the upper back. Okay, so that's how you can improve somebody's lunge. My friend Steven here is really good at it, but a lot of times you're gonna see people have very dysfunctional lunges, and that weight distribution can cause a lot of issues, particularly in the knees, in the groin, in the back, stuff like that. So it's all about how you execute or how you start a movement, okay? Next thing we're gonna do is another final movement pattern that's gonna be a push, a little bit different than a uh, regular push-up. I like to do a stability push-up. This makes it a little bit more challenging simply because we change the size or the angle of the movement, okay? So with the regular push-up, we put our hands just where we feel comfortable for this one. We're gonna place our hands in line with the top part of our ear. Okay? This is what we call a stability push-up. Again, it's going to test the mechanics or the right muscle groups that we use to create a push pattern. Okay? Now, it's marked out of a three system. A zero, it's not happening. A one, I can push, but at the expense of maybe where I'm lacking a lot of core stability. Okay? Two, I kind of transition away from one another, but I eventually get there. And then a three. So the blades are down and back, I think my feet in, so tucking my chin in a little bit, and I come up as flat as possible, okay? We'll see how you can do this. Sir. Okay. Yeah, so make sure that when you go to create this movement, a lot of times when people try to get through this particular push pattern, they'll start to recruit their hands from that high position and they'll just bring them back down. So you want to try to avoid that. Stay in that same range or stay in that same lever and then push from that position. Go ahead and push again, good. Okay, so I'm gonna give you one hint here and this is something you can do if somebody's really close to doing it completely proper. Hump the ground as hard as you can. So pull your pelvis into the ground to keep that rigidness. So squeeze your glutes essentially. Pinch your shoulder blades back and then try to generate the movement out of that position. Good. Okay, so that, if we were to mark that out of a three system for Steven, we'd probably give him like a two and a half. Where do you think the missing link is for you? And we talked about it in the lunge and we talked about it in the gait pattern. The ability to keep the hip in a neutral position. Your lower back kind of curves in, okay? Are you able to recruit a lot of strength in the upper quadrant or those extremities? Your chest muscles, your shoulder muscles, your triceps, absolutely. Are you recruiting the right neutral position in the hip? Not necessarily. That could be a collection of things. It may not just necessarily be your hip joint. We're gonna analyze your feet too, and maybe that could be a component too. If I'm unable to kind of create that feet from position. Okay, but overall, it's not terrible. If you see people doing push-ups where their back is like this, okay, they're really just overloading that anterior chain and they have no neutral spinal recruitment, okay? If somebody is typically lacking that proper push mechanic, do we do a full-fledged push? No, what we would focus on is the ability to retract the shoulder blades or garner mobility to the upper back or the scapula. So we do something called a scapular motion, okay? Where we literally learn the mechanics of retracting the shoulder blades in relation to creating a good pull pattern or a good push pattern. It should start or originate from you being able to stabilize the shoulder joints and recruit that scapular or that back muscle, okay? Cool, so we're gonna move on. 
next test we will do. This is for a deeper, actually I should say, less of a deep core test. This is more just for testing the abdominal wall, you know, the noticeable abs. We're gonna do a sit up. Now, it's very rare in any type of training program that I will create that we're gonna do a sit up, simply because if I'm in a sit up pattern, it's leading back into those issues that we talked about when it comes to posture in relation to expanding the body, getting yourself more energy, moving better, distributing weight, blah, blah, blah. So it's very rare that we would do an exercise that does a sit up because it's just bad for posture. And a lot of times people don't have good posture, they're gonna feel it through their quads, their lower back, their flexors. They're not even gonna really feel it through their abdominal wall. But for testing reasons, we wanna see how strong the abdominal wall is, and then we're gonna go into some deeper core stuff. So we will do a sit up. I'll teach you how to do a safe sit-up. A safe sit-up would involve you pulling your shoulder blades back, keeping the hips engaged. You almost want to let your knees go out a bit and keeping your head flat. So I'm not rounding my neck. I'm just keeping my back as flat as possible and I'm coming up as flat as possible, okay? And we'll do this test and it's kind of like an endurance test. So we'll do about as many reps as you can in one minute, okay? So whenever you're ready, we will get started with that.